All right, welcome back in, everybody. Rob Mellis and my guy, Tony Shields, hanging out with our Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network, on this Thanksgiving Eve. And again, hope you all have a great Thanksgiving with yourself, your family, and however you, you, you celebrate, whoever you're celebrating with, that's for sure. All right, Bills coming up. Bills coming up this Sunday. Big game with the Eagles. This is part of that stretch of games that we, thought we circled as soon as the schedule came out. Certainly, and I, you know, I don't think we thought going in that Buffalo would be six and five at this juncture I know I in the season. So let's get to the bottom of why that is the case. And we are joined next by Mike Catalana, who does an excellent job covering the Bills. He is the sports director, thirteen W H A M and Buffalo Plus on YouTube. Mike, what's up, my man? How you doing? All good, all good, Rob. Good to see you, Tom. Mike, great to see you as well, man. Um, so let's start with that very, very basic question. If you had to put your finger on why this team's six and five, what would it be, Mike? Yeah, I just think this has been a very, very inconsistent football team. They started out the year with a horrendous game against the Jets, and I think we all learned pretty quickly that Jets defense is good, but everybody remembers that's the game where Aaron Rodgers, you know, had the Achilles injury, four snaps in, so you figure, oh, the Bills will take care of it, and Josh Allen was atrocious in that game. Now, he took the heat took the blame, and then played really well for a few weeks, blew out the Dolphins. He always blows out the Dolphins. <laughs> and then they fell apart again. And Allen started making mistakes. The offense fell asleep. I mean, fellas, they lost to the Jets. They lost to the Patriots, who, when the Eagles played them at the beginning of the year, maybe they looked like they could be okay. They were in a horrendous stretch, and the Bills went there and lost. They lost to the Broncos back at home. They almost lost to Tampa. They yeah. almost lost to Terod Taylor and the Giants. So mm. they were really struggling. Allen was struggling. I think they found a little now, but they deserve to be six and five. You know, Mike, uh, first and foremost, thanks again for coming onto the platform. We really appreciate your time, sir. Um, it, it's so Josh Allen's career is so fascinating to me because he's easily one of the top three most talented quarterbacks in this game. It's no debate about it. His ability to just make things happen is is, is tremendous. But you know, with great with great power comes great responsibility and you know, I don't really care about turnovers that much. It's a new NFL. You pass the ball a lot. You're going to throw interceptions. They happen. But it seems like his interceptions are so costly. They're so damning. Um, what, what do you think has been the issue with Josh Allen and his development and trying to be uh, a more, um, I guess, effective quarterback? Again, he's efficient. You see he's completing yeah. 70% of his passes. He, he gets it done, but it's the turnovers. Well, what's the disconnect here? Yeah. Um... Look, some of it is coaching. There are Bills fans who will say, just let Josh be Josh. And we've seen moments of that. We call it the Josh Allen experience. You guys have all seen it. Yeah. Sleeping over people, hurtling, great throws, all that stuff. Fellas, that's not the way he's been turning the ball over this year. We talk about arm arrogance from a guy like Allen where he thinks, I can make that throw, and then it gets picked. That's not what he's been doing. It's bad decision-making. Look, I don't think – that Ken Dorsey, the now former offensive coordinator, was really putting him in a good spot, and people think they were trying to tone Allen down. They were trying to keep him from making some of the mistakes he's made. It's been bad reads and bad throws, not necessarily squeezing the ball into a tight spot and getting picked off. So he is an incredible talent. Look, this week against the Jets, this past week, he played much better. You saw some of that fire come back. I think fans have been looking for him to sort of liven up again the way he's been. He thinks he's back a little, which we'll see now coming into Philly, but he is a tremendous talent. He has been at a really, really, real high level. And when Brian Dable left, things changed a bit. Now he's hoping to get that back with Joe Brady as his new OC. Mike, do you think, like, we heard some of this um... – I don't think he took as much accountability. Let me let me be real about this. But we saw a little bit of this with Carson Wentz here where it came, became kind of a hero ball thing where he was just trying to make plays back there, whether it was holding the ball too long or bad turnovers or those kind of things. Josh has said all the right things. I remember leading into the season, he talked about how I, I got to turn it over less and I can't be this bad in the red zone and, and, and et cetera. But do you think he really gets it? Because it seems like when he gets on the field, it doesn't necessarily translate to what he's saying prior to the game. Yeah, look, I'm big on a quarterback taking accountability, even when it's a little bit of the fake accountability because I think that <laughs> plays well with the teammates. Right. Right. In that first game, I'm in the press room at the at MetLife Stadium after they've lost that game, and he was uh, angry at himself. 
and he took the accountability and he said, when your quarterback plays like crap, you can't win games. Like he really owned it. Right. And I told my guys I work with, I go, I think that was a seminal moment for him. That was a tipping point where he's like, I can't do this. And then we saw him turn around for a while and then he fell back into it again. And the mistakes were just so frustrating. And look, there's taking accountability and I'm in the media room in or park after they lose to Denver and he's sitting there sort of despondent and not really look, I get it. You're upset after a game, but you're the quarterback stand up and take it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that he wasn't taking, he really wasn't saying anything. And I think he needed to snap out of it. So um, I think he does do that. I think mm -hmm. his teammates support him. I don't think there's a question about that, but at times when it's going this way, you paid him a quarter of a billion dollars. Like, you're going to expect this out of him. Not that right. you don't expect mistakes, but I do think that he's needed to sort of, I made the joke, like, you know, I'm old enough. Maybe Rob would know this too. The, the movie Moonstruck where she smacks him in <laughs> the face. out of it. Snap yeah. out of it, right? <laughs> Chair. Yeah. He at this week, I said yeah. it to two people I work with. They looked at me like, what? Country? Yeah, it's the best feeling when you throw a reference out there. It just dies but on it, mind. But it yeah. fit. And then he yeah. seems yeah. to have snapped out of it. So you may be seeing at least the. Okay more connected version of Josh this weekend. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, we briefly touched on like, you know, coaching turnover and mm -hmm. just problems with coaching. Right. Uh, Sean McDermott, you know, he's, he's been coaching there for a handful of years now. Um, they've had success. They made it to, I believe, an AFC championship before um, they, they've always been in the thick of it. Right. Um, I felt like last year in, in, in that Bengals matchup at home, um, that was, that was alarming, at least for me. Right. You know, just watching that game. And I'm curious to know what's what's been your evaluation of Sean McDermott as a head coach right now. Some people say he's on the hot seat. Some people say, well, they just paid him. So how can he be um, again? Again, what's been your evaluation of Sean McDermott over the past several years and more specifically him as a coach this year and how he's handled Josh Allen and all the turbulence? Yeah, it's been a different kind of year. Look, we always use the line NFL stands for not for long, right? In Philly, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Doug Peterson wins the Super Bowl. A few years later, he's out. I mean, <laughs> you you got to tell us. <laughs> yeah, right. So it can happen. But keep in mind the history of this franchise when Sean McDermott came in. I mean, just, mm -hmm. I mean, I this is 35 years for me covering this team. So I was there for all the glory years and then 20 years of nothing. Mm -hmm. They were They were irrelevant. Sean McDermott comes in, gets him to the playoffs in 2017, breaks the drought, rebuilds the team, brings in Josh Allen. They get to the playoffs. Then they get to the AFC title game. The problem has been, you know, you run into the Chiefs, and that's one thing. But then last year, you run into the Bengals, and it's clear now that the Bengals had taken the spot above the Bills. So it's been a little bit rougher. But if you're the ownership of the Bills, you're sitting there going, we had Doug Marone and Rex Ryan before this guy. Mm -hmm. And now look what we have. So... They need that stability, and I think Sean has been pretty good, but he moved on from Leslie Frazier, the defensive coordinator, took over that role. Now he's moved on from his OC. So the target is right on him. He needs Joe Brady to be good. He needs to be good. I'm not saying they're moving on from him. It would have to be somebody that they feel maybe offensively can take them to another level if they decided to do it, but this is certainly the most heat he's ever felt in Buffalo. Brady was was the hot guy for a minute, you know, and and it all kind of cooled off with him, and then he resurfaced in Buffalo. Um, how much? Of, I guess twofold here, Mike. How much of it do you think was Dorsey, and what is your expectation of Brady kind of getting this? It's not like the numbers are bad. I mean, they're they're seventh in scoring, but yeah, the, you know, to kind of honus this and and get it head it where it needs to be consistently. Look. <laughs> I think Dorsey's a very bright guy. Obviously, he was a very successful player in college as a quarterback. He knows the game. I don't think he really had the connection with Josh Allen. Brian Dable did. Dable is, you know, sort of the guy's guy, and it just worked with Allen. And he could, he built him up and then got him to that place, and he had that relationship with him. Dorsey was around with him. It just was different. And people who I trust in the league would tell you that the Bills were some of the most predictable offensive sets mm. going in the league mm. and you have Josh Allen at quarterback and Stefan Diggs, like you have players that can make plays and they were predictable. So I think not only is it a change and maybe in some philosophy, but it's also a connection. And it was interesting when Joe Brady took over, the first thing he did was got on his news conference and he was like, I'll take Josh Allen over every guy in the league. I mean, he pumped him up big first day. He's got that sort of, you know, 
yeah, good yeah. feel with Allen. He's 34 years old. He just, you know, he was with Joe Burrow in college, sure. right? Mm-hmm. He's got that with him. And I think Allen needed that. I think he needed to snap out of it that way. So I think they've made that connection. The next step is, can you call the plays, right? Can you make it work week in, week out? I mean, we know the Jets have a good defense. Mm-hmm. He called a really good game for that one, and it worked. But now the question is, you put some of that on tape. The Eagles have seen it. Every other team's going to see it. Can you evolve as a play caller with Allen with a short period of time left in this season? Mike, you uh, briefly referenced uh, Stefan Diggs. Um, yeah. Over the past couple of years, it kind of seems like um, him and Allen's relationship has kind of been um, up and down. Um, and then you have uh, his brother, Trevon Diggs, who's currently nursing um, a season-ending injury on social media, barking about get my brother out of Buffalo, all those kinds of yeah. things. And Stefan, he stepped up to the plate and he you know, disowned you know, those words. But I'm curious to know, um, where are you? In terms of Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs' um, current relationship right now, is there any, is is there any more turbulence with that, or has that kind of been put to bed? I love Diggs. I think he is a tremendous player, and I think he's been a phenomenal teammate. And I think some of this stuff is so overblown mm. um, that you know the perception from people a lot of times. Look, there was an issue with those two, something in the off season, and he Diggs described it as a family thing with them and they got it sorted out. And, you know, as media guys, we're all waiting to talk to Diggs. He went in the whole off season. Diggs is a guy who spent most of the, a lot of the year, uh, off season in Europe. He flew his trainer over there and worked out. The guy is in phenomenal shape, great route runner, great player, always p- picks up numbers. And he's on the field constantly pumping up his teammates, offense and defense, always supporting Allen. So we waited for him to come back that year. And he sat down with us at training camp and was, phenomenal talking about his place in Buffalo, where he is, how he wants to retire there. He's done nothing in my opinion to change that. You see a shot of him on the sidelines. You guys know you see AJ Brown and Jalen. Oh, yeah, we know, we know. And they're tight as can be. Yeah, I know. watch Allen and Diggs at practice hanging out. They got their handshakes. They're to, I, I don't see any of that. And Diggs got a little upset in general with the media Cause he's like, basically I got to keep saying this all the time right. because my brother said that. Now, look, I don't care what his brother has to say for, he plays for the Cowboys. He doesn't play for the bills. And he said it during the middle of the game, but Diggs has got to realize it's your brother and he's an NFL player. And right. he says that I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he and Allen are really good. Now he hasn't really done anything the last couple of games, which is odd. And I know they want to get him going again. So I think you'll see a lot of targets to him this week, but I, I am a, I didn't know what to expect with him coming in. I think he has been incredible with Buffalo. Mike defensively um, they're fourth in points allowed. They're yeah. 16th against the run. They're 10th against the pass. I mean, all, all told again, good numbers, right? And stuff that wouldn't lead you to think a six and five team. How legit is this defense? Well, they, they are, they've been banged up. Look, mm-hmm. Matt Milano is a great player. I think he's one of those guys, unless he's not a, he does he never speaks. He just says nothing. Um, but he is a great player. And missing him for the year has really been impactful. Daquan Jones was a real force on the defensive line. They lost them. Von Miller plays. He's not Von Miller at all right now. He's number 40. He's out there running around, but he has been totally ineffective, obviously coming off the ACL. So they've lost those guys. I think Sean McDermott, while it might have hindered him a bit as the head coach, I think he's done a great job calling plays on defense. You know, he's had to mix and match. He's had players out. This week, uh, you know, Taron Johnson, uh, he's a slot guy. You know how they miss Avante Maddox in Philly. Taron Johnson is one of the best. They play in that nickel slot defense 90-some percent of the time because they love this guy so much. He's in concussion protocol, and I don't think he's going to play I guess we'll see on Sunday. Huge loss. So they've had guys go in and out of the lineup, and I think they've done a good job. They haven't turned teams over much, which has hurt the offense. I think that's been the part where teams can get yardage, move the ball down the field. Bill's field position has been lousy. This past week, our your good friend, Rasul Douglas, had a great game. <laughs> uh, He's resurrected his career. Yeah, he, man. He was really good. Uh, a yeah. couple of picks and a fumble recovery, which they desperately needed. So. Mm-hmm. That's been the one thing. They have not turned people over since the beginning of the year. Um, But I think this defense is good. 
but they, but with, I'm telling you, they will miss Taron Johnson in the slot this week. Dane Jackson, another corner who's a pretty good player, not going to play. And we, well, I shouldn't say not going to play. He's in protocol too. And then Taylor Rapp, backup safety, got hurt. He might be ready to go. So they're banged up in the secondary too. Mike, you know, there's this narrative uh, circulating that the Bills' Super Bowl window is slowly closing. Uh, how much do you buy into that? Well, you know, Joe Burrow's got the line, the window's open as long as I'm here, <laughs> which is funny because I tell people, I think Josh Allen believes that too. He just doesn't say it. Right. I mean, he doesn't come across that way. I mean, when you have Josh Allen, and even though he's been a bit up and down, he's a tremendous talent. But when you say the window is closed, I always feel like really good quarterbacks, franchise guys, will maybe play with two or three different rosters mm -hmm. while they're there, right? Because things change. Players change. Yeah, They've done a decent job. Brandon Bean is the general manager. Uh, but they've missed on a few. They drafted Kyrie Elam in the first round. Number one pick. He doesn't even play. They put him on IR. He's been a bust oh. for them. Uh, you know, they drafted a couple of guys in the second round. They ended up moving on from them on the defensive side. And the wide receiver position outside of Diggs has been up in the air. Now, they did draft Dalton Kincaid. And I'm pointing out guys that can keep this window going. Yeah. They're still talented. They're still good. They can catch fire because they do have Allen. Um, but look, you went from AFC title game to losing in that 13-second game, which just hangs over the franchise and then get knocked out in the first round by the Bengals, so, or first game for the Bengals. So it feels like it's going backwards. I don't think it's closed, but you got work to do, no doubt about mm. it. Mike, we were talking about this yesterday. Ironically enough, you, you know, Sean McDermott's from this area coaching the Bills, and then yeah. there's Nick Sirianni, who, who grew up in Jamestown, New York. So give me the impressions uh, uh, from, from your standpoint and what the folks there – think about Sirianni what was he a well-known commodity because frankly when he came here he wasn't that well known um and yeah. he's obviously done an amazing job but but your thoughts on Sirianni yeah I don't think that this area knew him at all I mean he's from you know Jamestown but you know he's been coaching and playing in Ohio and in different parts and then all of a sudden it's oh yeah this guy and then I find oh he's from Jamestown like I didn't know he was from near Buffalo mm -hmm. and then came in I gotta tell you all I heard from people who know, you know, where I'm from in the beginning, from the first news conferences, oh, who's this clown the Eagles hired? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And all I thought was, well, the players are going to decide this. And that's what ends up happening. I mean, we've had guys here, you know, Rex Ryan walks in, wins the first news conference. It's still Rex Ryan, yeah. you know, Doug Marone, those kind of guys. Like maybe they can coach, but that isn't the thing. I think Sirianni has taken a... I mean, people have watched him. Look, do they like all the stuff he does? No. People say it all the time. I mean, Sean McDermott claps on the sidelines. That's the extent of what yeah. you get out of him. And, but that's who he is. I right. tell people, Sean is the most disciplined human being I've ever been around. I mean, still works out at 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, he has like one snack a, a day that is not, you know, within the food groups he's supposed to eat. <laughs> think about it. He took over for Rex Ryan. Um, <laughs> I think with Sirianni, I think most, you know, Bills fans, look, I, it's been nice for me up here when the Eagles have been in the Super Bowl. They hate the Patriots and they hate the Chiefs. So everybody's been on board right, with right. down here. So they were rooting for him. And he does have that Western New York tie, which which was good. But, you know, people think he's a lot. And you see him coming off the field with the Chiefs and he's yeah, a yeah. lot. Yep. But he wins. And he wins a lot, and they'll certainly take a guy that can win. Yeah, I was just talking to Rob earlier about how a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of people, the, one of the reasons a lot of people don't really put Nick Sirianni in those conversations with like the McVeighs and the Mike McDaniel yeah. and the, you know, and the Stefanskis or whatever is because his personality can be a bit brash, you know what I mean? But, you know, it's so interesting. His quarterback uh, is the complete opposite of him, yeah. you know, stoic, very poised, very balanced, very measured. Um, very manicured in w with what he says. You know what I mean? Uh, what's been your evaluation of Jalen Hurts, um, you know, since he came into the league, um, you know, his progression, um, just how he's elevated his game to this level? What's been your overall thoughts on Jalen Hurts as a quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles? Yeah, look, I, you know, I watched him, um, obviously, in college like everybody else did. And we ended up with Brian Dable here who coached him. And he would just rave about Hertz and rave about Tua. Love both those guys. So you start to realize a little bit more what the guy's like. And – when he got drafted by the Eagles, I remember thinking, 
they took Jalen Hurts in the second round? I mean, that was what I thought because, you know, I knew where they were with Wentz, and I thought, wow, that's early to be taking a quarterback. And obviously it's turned out the way it is. I don't think I've – I thought I used to think that watching Josh Allen every day progress from a guy, even though he was seventh pick, to become a, you know, all – you know, all-star, you know, all-pro quarterback and a guy taking them to the verge of the AFC championship game twice and the Super Bowl where he would have had a chance was a tremendous progress, right? Because everybody thought, oh, he's this wild card. He can't be accurate, all those things. But the progress from Hertz has been, to me, incredible. I, I, I mean, there's, there's always people you don't expect their success, but to have everybody so defined as to what he was. You know, mm -hmm. he's a running guy. He'll be a good backup and all those things to move into where he is now and him not changing. Nothing seems to change with the guy. And I think that's half the battle, maybe 80% of the battle for these guys as they move their way up to not be a different guy when you start, when you become the franchise guy, when you get paid. To me, that's the most impressive thing about him is the fact that he seems like the same guy who walked in the door and now as a star quarterback. Mike, when you look at, and I, I obviously I'm asking this because I know you keep a close eye and pay close yeah. attention to the Eagles. You look at the, the rest of the NFC, Cowboys, Niners, Lions, and whomever else you want to throw into that mix. Uh, who, do you, who do you see? Who do you see as the threat for the Eagles? Um, look, it, the Cowboys are good. I mean, they, you know, they blow out the bad teams and they've been tough in a couple other games. And obviously that Eagles game was crazy. So, you know, I, I as much as I, tell my Cowboys, I say friends, you know, it's a stretch, but <laughs> as much as I tell them, you know, that the Eagles have it, I, I you know, they're, they're still right there and that game's going to be large for them. Um, I think the lions are fun to watch. I don't know if I would trust them yet in a big spot, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see where they are, but that team can score some points. We saw them come back. Uh, Dan Campbell, a little bit like Sirianni, right? He comes in and you're like, what is this guy doing? But he was changing a culture there. It's a little different for Sirianni, but he really was with the Lions being a losing franchise. And the Niners are really solid and really good, but they'll find something to complain about no matter what. So, <laughs> so, but those those are really good teams. I I think honestly, I told people at the beginning of the year, I thought the NFC was as good as the AFC. I didn't see this AFC dominance. And now with the injuries to the quarterbacks, I think the AM, NFC is a deeper conference. Mm -hmm. Um and I think it's going to be, it's tough coming out of the end. You look at the AFC now. I mean, very the, wide open. It is right. I mean, the chiefs are still good. I mean, yeah. right. The Ravens can be really good, but do you trust Lamar yet in the playoffs? Well, and no Mark Andrews. And right. That's a big loss for them. And no Bengals without their quarterback. And you just don't see a lot in the NFC. I mean, look, you, you do have, you got the Niners, the Cowboys, the Eagles, the lions, and then you see what else, you know, shakes out there. So I think it's going to be a tough stretch. That's why. Games like this for the Bills and the Eagles, it's bigger for the Bills. There's no question. They're only six and five, but you got to pile up the wins in addition to winning the ones in your conference. So, you know, the Lions, you know, you'll see them on Thanksgiving. They're only a game behind them in the standings. So I think it's going to be a battle all the way to the end. You know, Mike, I'm looking at the AFC standings right now with the Bills being the eighth seed at six and five. They're behind the Steelers, yep. uh, the seventh seed, Houston Texans, who, who are shocking the world at the sixth seed. Um, Browns, uh, fifth seed right now, but I don't know how, if they can sustain it. You know, Dolphins, Jags, Chiefs, Ravens, so on and so forth. But, you know, by my estimation, they're right in the thick of things, right? You know, they can easily, you know, jump all the way up to who knows, maybe, maybe even when their division, if the Dolphins drop two, they're right there in it. You know, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know how, how desperate is this Bills team? Um, this Sunday going up against the Philadelphia Eagles, knowing how bad they need this win and knowing how close they are to just putting themselves back into the playoff race. Yeah, I mean, look, specifically this game, I, I mean, I think there's a level of desperation because they put themselves where they were 5-5 five and five coming home for the Jets. But they have this game. Then they have the bye. Then they go to Kansas City, a place they've actually won the last two years in the regular season when they've been there. Then they come home for the Cowboys. So look at those three games that they're facing. Now they still have – yeah, they still have the Patriots again, you know, and they have the Chargers on the road. Who knows what you get with that team? Um, but they end with the Dolphins in Miami. Josh Allen has played very well against the Dolphins. They need to stay within a game of the Dolphins, no matter what anybody else does. 
If they can stay within a game of the Dolphins, they have the shot to go down there and beat them in the last game of the regular season and win the division because they would have swept the two games. I think that's the one thing they hold on to. They don't have a great conference record. They do not have a good division record. Head-to-head is the place that they could get it done. And then you don't know what happens with the rest of these teams. I watch the Steelers, and I'm like, I don't see how they win games, but they've done it. So you don't know what they're going to do the rest of the way, but I still believe that the Bills' best shot is winning the division to get into the playoffs. What do you think happens in this game, Mike, this week? Look, I, I, I think the... Bills need the Eagles to not be on their A game. If they, yeah, both yeah. teams right now play their best game, it's the Eagles by 10 mm-hmm. or more. Mm-hmm. And they, I know they haven't blown people out a lot. I think they're better. They're certainly been better than it, than the Bills. But the Bills have, you know, they found this little window here. I think they are feeling much better about themselves. I think if the Eagles go in there, you know, long, short week after the trip and all that stuff that can pile up on a team with the Niners and the Cowboys coming up, could they take a step back? Yeah. I do think it sounds so simple, but turnovers are huge. When the Bills don't do it, and last week they only had one and it was a Hail Mary at halftime. When they don't give the ball up, they are a different team. And I think that's going to be a key. So, uh, look, it's hard to pick the Bills in this game. The Eagles have been so good at home. But I would just say to Eagles fans, like, they may only be 6-5 and and they may not be what people thought they were, but you know this league. If they feel something, team comes in fired up, they absolutely can come into Philly and win that game. Mm. Mm, final question for me, Mike. Um, this is a, a little bit of a sidebar from the Eagles and, yeah. and the Bills. Um, we briefly talked about Dayball and his impact yeah. on Josh Allen. Now he's in New York, um, uh, the, the, the Giants, the Eagles rival. What's been your thoughts on his tenure there? And obviously things are not going well this season. Um, just give me your overall evaluation of what's going on in New York with the Giants and Brian Dayball and um, the pressure he's under to try to uh, figure this thing out with Daniel Jones, you know, for the front office, so on and so forth. Yeah, look, I, I like that guy as much as any coach that I've been around. I, I think he's great. He doesn't show that in New York. It's different. You know, he's the head coach. I thought they made a massive mistake at the end of the year when they didn't. I would have moved on from Daniel Jones or done something else. It's funny. He was with the Bills, and show was jo- uh, Joe Shane, the GM, when they made the playoffs in 17. Or that's when he came into the Bills in 18. You would think you'd see, like, take that step back and then move forward. I think they have a terrible roster. Mm. Uh, certainly offensively, yeah. a terrible. I, I, I see no weapons. I see bad moves. I see a bad offensive line. So that's a big thing for him. But, again, in this league, you know, the Giants have not had a lot of patience with coaches. And they've had a lot of failures with coaches. I know the guy can coach. I know with the right quarterback, he can get it done. And they don't have the right quarterback. I think they're pretty fortunate that the season has gone so far south for them that they're going to end up with a high pick. But they need to, that's what they need to do. Or otherwise, whatever patience fans have for a guy who did get him in the playoffs last year, it's just going to be gone quickly. That's the way this league is, right? And he hasn't earned enough of that yet with the way they played and they've had injuries guys, they lost the first game 40 to nothing to the Cowboys at home. Like that's not a way to start a post playoff season. So he knows he's got work to do, but honestly they're better off losing games down the stretch and get a shot at one of these young quarterbacks. Cause that's what they're going to need to do. All right. Lastly, Mike, Thanksgiving tomorrow, uh, favorite side, not, not the main, not Turkey or ham or whatever, whatever you and the, and the family are doing. And what, what, what are the plans too, while we're at it? Yeah, we're home. We've got everybody coming over. Okay. You know, I, the Bills have been in the in a Thanksgiving game three of the last four years. So, you know, it's been a lot of travel. We were in Dallas, uh, we were in uh, New Orleans, and we were in Detroit three of the last four years. So mm-hmm. they played in every time uh, frame for Thanksgiving too. During that time, here's my take on it. I grew up in an Italian household. Yeah. Whatever Italian food we have on the side is my favorite side. And <laughs> the turkey, the mashed potatoes, the mm-hmm. stuffing, all that. I I want the other two. Yes. I need the other two. It's not my favorite meal of the year. Yeah. It's good. You know, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. But I'm looking for whatever my wife's coming up with as the side. I'll just now, are, do the you side. get annoyed if well, all right, let me ask you. Is it gravy or sauce? I'm not talking about the stuff you put on turkey. I mean, when right. you put on pasta, is it gravy or sauce? In our house, it's sauce. It was always sauce growing up. I okay. know with a lot of people, it's gravy. 
Okay. We grew up with sauce. You know, it's like soda and pop, like whatever works for you. All right. Um, but yes, it was always it was always sauce. I don't know. That, you know, I, I grew up in Jersey. I don't know if it's a South Jersey thing. South I think Philly, it, it might more. be gravy. Yeah, I think. <laughs> right. I think it might be more. My mom grew up in Western Pennsylvania. My dad yeah. was from South Jersey. So, yeah, uh, maybe that's the difference in it. But okay. uh, whatever it is. I need some of that on Thanksgiving. I got you. I got Sounds you. good. Mike, good stuff, man. Uh, appreciate you hopping on. Let everybody know where they can catch you, where the YouTube show is, et cetera. Give, give yeah, the info. Uh, it's Buffalo Plus on YouTube, uh, and, and we have a lot of fun with it. So check that out. Uh, Twitter is just Mike Catalana. And, uh, yeah, I, again, you'll you'll usually get some Philly takes from me there, too. You know, as okay. I watched the Sixers, how they lost that game last oh, night. Oh, brutal. Let's see what they do. Bad loss yes, and yeah. following everybody else. So, um, and the Phillies and, and everything else that goes on in Philly. So Mike Catalano, Twitter and uh, 13 way on TV is ABC uh, in Western New York. So that's where you can find me. All right, Mike, Mike, thank you so much, man. Work. Appreciate Definitely. a couple minutes. I'm going to subscribe right. right now. Buffalo right. plus going to subscribe right now. Thank you so much, sir. Happy All right. Thank Mike. you guys. All right. Take care. All the best. Mike's a great guy, man. We, we, I met Mike years ago at the uh, NFL combine. Okay. The year after the Eagles won it, we sat down, we started talking Philly sports and I'm like, man, I gotta have you on my show. He's I gotta have you on my one. All right, boom, we'll go from there. And uh he, he's he's really he's a fun guy to catch up with. So good information there. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Um I, I, I truly appreciated his insight. Uh you yeah. know, great listen, uh great conversation for sure. One of the yeah. best we've had. All right, we'll get a timeout here. We'll come back. Uh we're gonna hit a bunch. We're gonna work in some some Thanksgiving fair. We'll talk about a little more about that Sixers game. And there was a an NBA game last night, Tone, where 309 points were scored total. Three oh nine are you kidding me all right so we'll talk about all that when we get back he's tone the shields i'm rob ellis we are sports take right back